happening now. Excellent. So welcome everyone to our MedStar Emergency Physicians Pop-Up um, and Learn Educational Series. We're very pleased to have um, Dr. Rory Spiegel uh, presenting on a, on a very timely and pertinent topic today. Um, Dr. Spiegel comes to us from uh, emergency medicine residency training at Newark Beth Israel in New Jersey, followed by clinical resuscitation fellowship at Stony Brook with Scott Weingart, uh, and um, followed most recently by critical care uh, training at University of Maryland Medical Center. Um, Dr. Spiegel works clinically in our ED at the hospital center and also um, serves as a faculty attending in the SICU. Um, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Spiegel. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, so um, the kind of background here is over the last few days, uh, we've kind of been uh, thinking about, you know, uh, how we would go about safely intubating the patients coming in with COVID and uh, or suspected COVID. Um, and myself and Shane Kapler has kind of reviewed what limited uh, research and documentation has been coming out. And so, so what we've come up with, um, which uh, I think JD will share with the group, is essentially recommendations that are taken from what uh, is being done in South Korea and Italy and China uh, on how they have protected my, themselves through this process. Um, and we'll kind of just run through everything from there. Um, so uh, any questions, you can just e email uh, Jonathan at Jonathan Davies at medstar.net, and he'll kind of read them, um, filter through them, and then we can kind of answer them at the end um, or at any part during the process as well. Um, so um, as you know, COVID um, is mostly spread through droplet and contact precautions. Um, the WHO and our family company MedStar has, you know, primarily taking care of these patients can be done with a surgical mask, gloves, um, and a, a non-permeable gown of sorts. Um, and just standard droplet and contact precautions do most of the time, um, except for in some very high-risk procedures, which are called aerosol generating procedures, um, in which you kind of get these plumes of aerosol respiratory droplets to kind of cascade through the room. Um, and there's a number of different procedures, which unfortunately we play a large role in, um, and probably will be playing a large role in these patients, given that we will probably be the front line as usual. Um, and so we thought we could kind of run through them. Um, the big ones um, on the list are intubation, non-immensive ventilation, CPR, and bronchoscopy. What we're going to focus on today is probably is mostly intubation because I think that's the role we're major we're going to be playing in these patients. Um, most of the recommendations coming out of Japan, South Korea, and uh, it, um, and Europe is not to perform bronchoscopy on them unless you really, really have to. Um, and uh, we are recommending not to use non-invasive ventilation um, as a mode to bridge these people for the most part. There's a small thing we'll talk about later on how you can use it momentarily. But for the most part, non-invasive ventilation probably should not be used in these patients. Uh, and finally, CPR uh, and BVM ventilation. Also, if someone comes in and arrest, uh, it's a very dire situation and we probably want to avoid it. Um, so, First thing to do is when you've decided that you're gonna intubate one of these patients, you wanna prepare as much as possible. Um, and the plan should be if possible, and if we still have the resource to move these patients to a negative pressure room before beginning the intubation process, because once you start it, you're gonna start aerosolizing respiratory particles throughout. Um, in addition, you wanna limit the amount of actual workers exposed to this high-risk procedure. So what we've said here is you're gonna have the intubating team, so that's whether one attending or attending in a resident. Um, the RT and one nurse in the room, all wearing protective gear, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, and then outside the room, we'll have one additional staff member, which we've decided will be a nurse in full PPE to get whatever equipment or medicine that might come up during the event that wasn't anticipated beforehand. Um, and that's kind of what our setup will be. So we limit the patients at risk of these high-risk procedures. Um, So the PP itself, like I said, for almost all patients who aren't critical and you're not doing one of these procedures, uh, both the WHO and MedStar recommend a surgical mask, um, a gown uh, and gloves, um, and some kind of air protect, uh, some kind of eye protection. Um, what we're recommending if you are going to do one of these aerosolized procedures, and it's a little bit in flux right now. We're also re recommending this if you are taking care of critical ill patients on the ventilator, though that might change um, once they're on a ventilator and a closed circuit. The risk of aerosolized particles is very minimal. But right now, what we're recommending in these patients is to wear an N95 mask if you're not fitted for one. Papper. Um, 
face protection, preferably some kind of face shield that covers your face completely um, or goggles that actually seal around your eyes instead of just you know the, the mask with the, the shield that goes over your eyes or, or the simple glasses where particles can get up and around it. What we have here are these full face masks um, that look almost like welder's masks that you can pull down over your whole face and cover everything. Um, and that seems to be also what they're using in South Korea. Um, but goggles would also suffice. Okay, so the, the process itself, um, so the big thing to consider here is you really want to intubate these patients fairly early. Um, if you look at both the, the data out of South Korea um, and um, Europe, they are not using high flow nasal cannula or BiPAP on them at all, and mostly after six to eight liters or moving straight to intubation because of the risk of spreading respiratory particles throughout the, the, the room and to other patients. So they're getting intubated very early. The other thing to think about as we get forward is you would rather this be a fairly stable intubation. The less positive pressure you have to give before an ET tube, in, uh, ET tube is placed, the better. Um, and so waiting until a patient has significant hypoxia um, on BiPAP or on high flow makes an intubation a much higher risk and, and much more likely to expose yourself and others to danger. So like I said, you want to avoid positive pressure ventilation before the ET tube is in as much as possible. Um, and what this means is you want to try to ensure proper pre-oxygenation and you do this in a rather stable manner. Um, if you so um, in order to do this, you have to ensure that you're actually pre-oxygenating the, the patients appropriately. Um, and this can be a little tricky in these cases, so we're gonna run through some hints on how to do this. This is not the patient that you just put a nasal cannula on and simply kind of let that run for a little bit. Um, you wanna ensure that you're actually getting proper nitrogen walk out. Sorry, that didn't show up right. That should say pre-oxygenation. Um, but the important thing to remember with pre-oxygenation is you want to optimize O2 saturation, which was fairly easy to see simply by looking at your O2 sat um, and deciding if you're over 95%, preferably 100%, you know you've actually achieved adequate saturation. But the one that's often forgetting is ensuring that you're getting proper denitrogenation, right? And so you actually have an oxygen reservoir in your lungs. This one's harder to do since most of us don't have end tidal oxygen monitoring and we can't tell when we have appropriate washout. Um, so what we typically do is make sure you give 100% FiO2 for three to five minutes, um, which most of the time will get appropriate FiO2 washout. So what we're going to talk about now is how to select the right oxygenation devices to ensure you get appropriate nitrogen washout and how to choose devices that aren't spraying respiratory droplets throughout the room. So 100% non-rebreather is a fairly reliable um, tool to do this. Um, the big issue with 100% or the big issue at, at MedStar is we don't have 100% non-rebreather. We have OxyMass. I'm not sure what if that's uh, med, MEP wide or that's just at hospital center itself. John, do you know? Um, I think it's it's fairly um, MedStar wide. Okay. Um, so what we've done here is we, we have a stash of non reviewers in the basement and we've actually ordered a supply of them to put into our BCU carts. So anyone that we're going to be uh, intubating with a non rebreather or anyone we're going to be intubating um, with uh, suspected COVID is someone we're not going to use an oxy mask on. You can imagine um, those big holes in the oxy mask as the patient exhales just kind of splaying respiratory droplets throughout the room, whereas a non-rebreather, at least you have a full face shield. The other thing to note, if you see up in the corner here, the little one-way valve here on, on the, the um, non-rebreather, most of them come with only one side with an, a one-way valve, and the other side is actually taken off. That was because if, some, if the oxygen fell out on a patient who wasn't really conscious and could pull it off themselves, the fear is that they would smother under the mask. Um, because we're using this in a very tight controlled situation where we'll be watching the patient, we're ordering them with have one-way valves on both sides. So it allows a little more control of the res respiratory droplets. Um, the big thing to know about uh, a non-rebreather is if you use it at the standard 15 liters that we say, um, it's not actually 100% non-rebreather. At best, it's 70%. And if the patient is actually taking pretty... Um, large breaths with respiratory stress, it'll drop down to 30% just because they entrain so much room air around it. Um, there is a trick that you could do that's quite simple to make it 100% FI2, and that's called flush rate O2. Um, and simply what you're doing here is the wall oxygen monitor 
though it says it goes up to 15 liters, you can actually go up much higher. And most of them go to 40 to 60 liters on the wall. Um, what you do is you simply attach your, your normal non-rebreather to it and you twist it up to 15 liters and you just keep twisting it. And it'll twist for a long time before it actually stops turning. And that's when you've reached your maximum. Um, it's going to sound like a jet engine. It's going to be like really loud. And that's how you know you've achieved appropriate um, flows. Um, there's a number of studies now demonstrating that with FiO2s at 40 to 60 liters in a non rebreather, you achieve as close to an anesthesia circuit as we can in the emergency department. So it's really a good, simple way to get oxygen washout. A non rebreather is also a really nice way. Um, it's slightly more complicated uh, how to, to set it up, but essentially, um, if you do it right and if you ensure a nice mask seal with a two handed grip around the mask itself, um, not only will it give you 100% FiO2 and good oxygen washout, but you actually will um, even have less respiratory particles that are, that are uh, released into the room. So, the important thing about a non rebreather, if you look at it here, you've got your big B, your, your bag, and your oxygen reservoir behind it, and you coming down to your mask here. This little guy here is called a peep valve that doesn't come with most BVMs. It's mostly just an exhalation port. And it's built to have positive pressure. So someone will squeeze the bag, generate positive pressure, and push air through a Heimlich valve right here, and we'll go into the patient. Um, like we said, we don't want to use positive pressure in these patients. So you're using it as a negative pressure oxygen device. And so what's going to happen is you put the mask onto the patient's face. You get a good mask scale. The patient will take a breath and generate negative pressure. If this oxygen exhalation port is open, like it is on a standard mask, the passive least resistance will draw air from the outside world and pull room air into the patient. So you won't get any 100% FiO2 and your pre-oxygenation will be inadequate. By putting a PEEP valve on here, this turns into a one-way valve. So air can go out, but it can't come back in. So now when the patient takes a negative breath, they generate enough pressure to open this Heimlich valve and pull oxygen from the oxygen reservoir. And so when you do this and you hold a, a mask seal on the patient, you now get 100% FiO2. And much like the non-rebreather at flush rate, this becomes a really good tool to oxygenate the patient. The added bonus is that um, with a good mask seal, you'll have much less respiratory droplets spraying through the room. That's a peep valve. Um, what we've done here to upgrade this even farther um, is add a viral filter. And so this is the high efficacy viral filters that go on your ventilator. We have them in our BCU cart and they attach between the BVM and the mask itself. So as the patient exhales, even with a peep valve, it's gonna come out that one-way port at the top right here. And the viral filters essentially attended to catch those particles before they go out and spray into the room. So now you have a closed system where you can be sure that you're not spraying too many particles throughout the, the room. And uh, Rory, just one question that came in. Um, does it matter what pressure you set the, um, the PEEP valve to? So that's a great question. Um, the PEEP valve, it, it doesn't matter how, what settings you set it on to. It, it'll function like a one-way valve no matter what. So as soon as you put it on, it is a one-way valve. What you set your PEEP to is really determined by the patient's oxygen level. So what a PEEP valve allows you to do is provide CPAP to the patient as you're trying to pre-oxygenate them. So with a non-rebreather, and this is getting a little outside what we're supposed to be talking about, but I think it's, it's interesting and important. So with the non-rebreather at flush rate, you can provide a lot of FiO2, but with patients like pneumonia, which a lot of these COVID patients have, you'll have some shunt physiology in the lungs. So some of the lungs will be kind of soggy and de-recruited and not participating in ventilation. So despite high levels of oxygen, you might not be able to pre-oxygenate them adequately or as, as you want. As you turn your PEEP valve up, you provide more and more CPAP, and you can, you can do that to, to up your oxygen saturation. So you would actually titrate that to get an FiO2 above 95%, essentially, understanding that that PEEP valve goes to 15, and that's where you kind of tap out. Does that make sense? Great. Cool. So the big disadvantage here is you need a good mass seal, right? And so you need someone to hold a two-hand seal while you're doing this. Like we said at the start, for us, we're only having three to four patients and people, providers in the room. And so it can get a little tricky having one of them taken out just by holding a mass seal the whole time. Um, so you really have to decide what your resources are and is it worth it using a BVM? Do you need to peep? And do you have enough providers to actually use it? Um, but if you do, it is actually a really handy, simple way of doing this. 
So the last way is slightly more complicated, and this is something we're working on here uh, at, at, at a hospital center. We don't have the respiratory therapist fully trained yet, um, but they're working on it and should be up and running in a week or so. Um, it's not hard, they just have to be familiar with it. And when what we're doing here is using the ventilator as a pre-oxygenation device. The important thing here to note is you can't use a simple BiPAP circuit itself. So if you use the machine that just does BiPAP, that's not going to work, and I'll go over why. You need an actual full ventilator. Let me see if I have it. Yeah, so this is, the, this is the simple BiPAP circuit. You can see there's one tube going to the patient. And so what the BiPAP machine does, it defines positive pressure, and there's an exhal exhalation valve somewhere over here, which splays respiratory particles out into the environment. So if you use a single tube system like this, you're actually gonna expose everyone to lots and lots of particles, so this isn't safe. If you use a ventilator, it's a closed system, and so it has a system where you have an inhalation port and an exhalation port throughout. So air is not actually sprayed into the system until it goes past this viral filter right here, and so you're, you're catching what you have in the viral filter um, so you don't expose anyone to those particles. For extra safety, we also put an extra viral filter right at the, be the, the mask itself. And so as the patient exhales, you get most of the viral particles caught at that point and you're not getting any much farther. The advantage of this is you have a really good mask seal um, without having anyone to hold it. Um, and the other big advantage is in patients that you are having trouble pre-oxygenating um, and you need more PEEP, you're, at, you're able to titrate your CPAP much easier with this than you are with the, the BVM and the PEEP valve on it. John, why don't I pause for a second and see if there's any questions? Certainly. And, and one question is, is um, most, um, do most of our RTs um, know how to set this up if, if they were asked in the ED setting uh, or elsewhere? Uh, the ventilator? Correct. Yeah, N not yet. So that was a big thing we were coming up with here. Um, I worked with our um, uh, RT director who is now actively training them on this setup. So this will be something that'll be um, ready for game time. Sorry, there's a lot of noise outside my office. Um, this will be something that's ready for game time here at hospital center in, in a week or so. Um, I imagine it's something that most places can train people on relatively quickly. It's not hard to do. Um, it simply just requires a viral filter set up between the, the mask and the, and the tubing um, and just understanding how to put your ventilator on spontaneous modes of ventilation is essentially all you need to do. Excellent. And so we can have our um, ED leaders, um, ICU leaders um, contact you to get in touch with the, uh, the RT folks at Hospital Center SICU. Yeah, that's perfect. Perfect. Um, so we talked about that. Um, and so uh, the important thing here is, is, like I said before, we really want to avoid using these single tubing BiPAP machines to either pre oxygenate a pa patient or to try to actually use it as management. So having the patients on this machine for long term, um, one, we don't have data on COVID patients particularly, but we know that long term on patients with, with severe pneumonia requiring BiPAP, the BiPAP doesn't prevent the intubation. It just delays it somewhat. And so we feel that delaying the, intub the inevitable intubation, exposing people to the respiratory droplets and making the patient sicker when you intubate them probably doesn't add up to benefit. Um, we've also said that high flow nasal cannula is a no-go on these patients simply for the same reason that you're just aerosolizing a ton of respiratory droplets and exposing a lot of people to, to the risk. Um, the, the final thing with your intubation, what we're recommending is a video laryngoscopy, either um, standard geometry or um, hyperangulated blades. But the big thing is using something where you can keep your head up and out of the actual oral cavity of the patient so you're farther away from any droplets that occur. So next is the drugs. So these should be RSIs, and these are good old-fashioned RSIs, so the kind where you pre oxygenate really well, you push your, your sedative and your paralytic, and you don't do any BVM. So you don't bag the patient throughout the apneic period because, again, we don't want to generate any RSROS particles or at least as little as we can. So this should be that good old-fashioned RSI, and that's why the importance of pre-oxygenation um, that we spent so much time discussing. Oh, talked about that. Um, if you do have to actually bag these patients, um, most of the recommendations are to put an LMA in if you can. Um, doing this is going to limit the amount of particles which you're spraying around the room um, and allow you to have a lot more control of your BVM. So anytime that you actually have to bag this patient, whether you can't get their saturation up before the RSI, they're just too sick, or 
you know, first pass success didn't go perfectly and you're going to have to bag them in between attempts, put having an LMA ready to go um, is something that we're recommending. And then much like the BVM, having the viral filter between the LMA and the bag will allow you to catch most of the particles before they're diffused around the room. So post intubation, um, a couple big things to think about here. Um, we're recommending strict ARDNET low lung protective ventilation just because what you're dealing with here is multifocal pneumonia and ARDS. So uh, protecting these patients lung early is important. Uh, I'm gonna send out our most uh, up-to-date guidelines for intubation in these patients are at the bottom. We have a quick reminder on, on what um, parameters you're going for lung protective strategy and then the, the standard ARGENET PEEP to FiO2 table, which helps you titrate your PEEP to your, your oxygen requirements. Um, and then the other thing to know, anytime you have to pop this person off the ventilator, that's a moment where you can really spray particles everywhere um, and aerosolize a lot. So at that point, we're recommending one of two things. Either you clamp the, ventil the tubing, the ET tube, um, with a Kelly before you pop them off the ventilator, or you have a viral filter at the end of your ET tube and take everything off after that. Most of these patients aren't going to have a viral filter sitting at the end of their ET tube, so probably clamping them is the only way you're going to do most things um, in this case. Um, in addition, um, suctioning, uh, opening suctioning should be avoided, right? So those red rubber catheters that you put down the tube to suction should probably not be done. If you're going to do any suctioning, it should be the inline suctioning where it's actually in the tubing itself, so it's all in case to avoid the particles spraying everywhere. Um, and then, like I said earlier, we're going to really try avoid bronching these patients because most of them have diffuse disease where bronching them really isn't adding anything and you're just exposing yourself to a lot of risk. I think that's it. Excellent. Really um, fantastic. And I, I just wanted to, um, to just uh, cover some of the, the key points to make sure that, um, that we were hitting on those and, and I and others understood them correctly. So the overall premise is really to avoid um, good pre-oxygenation without spray. Right, um, yep. so it's really avoiding um, the spray into the environment and the ways to achieve that. Um, number one, um, non rebreather, much better than an oxy mask for obvious yep. reasons and avoid spray. Number two is to, to develop that closed, relatively closed circuit, which is a bag valve mask with that peep valve, because without the peep valve, um, that when someone takes a breath, they're just going to be pulling in path of least resistance, which is room air and not oxygen that's coming from the bag reservoir. Exactly. Um, and then uh, the other option is with the ventilator, uh, but that, that requires a little bit of know-how from the respiratory therapist, something that they certainly will know how to do, um, but just uh, perhaps just need a little bit of um, in-service guidance um, from your team. And so we can refer folks um, to you to, to make sure that they're getting the right information. Um, and then the key things, I think many of us think of um, sick patients with respiratory illness um, the first tool on in our tool belt is BiPAP or high flow nasal cannula. But in these patients that are um, known or suspected um, COVID or persons under investigation, we really should avoid those at all costs. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the data coming out of Italy and uh, South Korea at, at, I think, eight liters above, they would intubate them. Okay. So okay, pretty right. low. Kind of eight and above. And then the viral filters, do you have any sense, um, at least at the hospital center, um, how prevalent those are, uh, available those are? Do they um, seem to be readily available? or? Um, yeah, so uh, I, I got a, a box of 50 of them this, by walking downstairs and picking them up. And they're now stocked in the BCU carts. Um, and Respiratory is ordering us 100 more, which should be here next week. So they're readily available and they're, they're aware and can stock them. So it's not, they definitely have them in the hospital. It's not something that, that you have to special order. Yep, absolutely. And then um, video laryngoscopy is really the key, just the mechanics of it. Standing up in an in a, um, upright position and utilizing the video to leverage as opposed to being in the direct right. line of sight, right? Exactly. Okay. And then, um, and Sonia, I, I know Sonia had a question. Um, if you want to unmute Sonia, uh, if you're still on the line, please feel free to, to ask. Sure. I was just curious, um, like I, I, I totally see why we want to use video laryngoscopy for these folks. Um, is there anything special that we need to do to clean the, like we're using a glide scope. Once we're done with that procedure, how do we quickly uh, make sure that that machine is decontaminated and ready for use again. You're using the disposable blade glide scopes? 
We are, yeah. So, so the, the blade's getting thrown out and it's just the machine. Um, yeah. So I, I, what we're doing is just Clorox wiping everything afterwards. Okay. You know, the, I mean, there, there, is, there is a lot of data on that this is fomite spread and it can last on things for hours to days. Um, but it seems that Clor Clorox, from my understanding, um, is sufficient in killing it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, anyone want to unmute um, or uh, feel free to email with, uh, with additional questions for Rory? was really, really a fantastic presentation. And um, the dialogue won't end here. Uh, what we're going to do is we'll uh, make sure that we resend out the um, the one pager that you put together, Rory, with the um, section of critical care team. Uh, we'll send that out to MEP ER all. Um, and obviously, if there's any any questions that anyone has, please feel free to email um, Rory. And um, Rory can uh, share additional details with the group. Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is a fast moving thing. And it's, it's changing constantly. So um, we kind of put it together with the best info we had and, and that could possibly change. So if we figure anything else out, we will adapt it as need be. And obviously, if anyone else has any information or any recommendations, we'd love to hear it.